that was all I needed tonight. That changed the luck. All I needed. Yeah, onwards and upwards from here. <laughs> Turn the corner, darling. Come on, darling. You might get lucky when I get you home tonight. Oh, well, that'd be a nice change. <laughs> hey! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Christ, it was a tough run, though. Oh, I was beginning to think you couldn't pick your nose, let alone a winner. <laughs> i tell you what, the bookies are run for cover, they see me coming. I've got a wedge on me you couldn't hurdle over. <laughs> and that's what you need in this town, a decent-sized wedge. I thought you were going to get new batteries for these. Yeah, all right, hold your fire. Give me the keys. I hope I don't fall off my wallet. <laughs> Man can break his leg falling from this height. Michael Mick Sayers, millionaire, arm robber, race fixer, drug dealer and gambler. He thought he could be king of the Sydney underworld. Tonight we examine the rise and fall of Michael Mick Sayers. Sayers was a convicted arm robber, drug dealer and murderer. But above all, he was a compulsive gambler. He would think nothing on betting $100,000 on the turn of a card or the bob of a horse's head. His biggest gamble, however, was trying to gain control of crime in Australia's largest city. Through dramatised scenes, psychological analysis and interviews with Sayers' friends, associates and family members, we will give a full picture of the greed, ambition and compulsions that took Sayers on a journey from a happy childhood to a chalk outline. Michael Sayers was a hardened career criminal uh, and he committed all crimes from murder down. Do I look like I'm kidding? He was dangerous because he had money and he could pay people to do do what was necessary if he felt a threat against his life. Mick Sayers was no pussycat. No. Mick Sayers could look after himself and uh, Mick Sayers had big, strong friends. Well, once he got involved in the drug trade, he saw himself as a future king of crime and uh, he got in the road and they bumped him off. I've got the money! He loved gambling. That was his whole life, gambling. I suppose you could say that was his whole life, a big gamble. To many people, Mick Sayers was a great man to be around. He loved a laugh and a good time. But under the surface lurked a ruthless, impulsive criminal with a massive ego. This was a man who coldly walked out on his wife to fulfil his dreams of taking over the Sydney crime scene. Sayers was tough. For five years, he was the SP bookie in Pentridge Prison. And when some of Australia's most violent offenders welched on their bets, Sayers had no qualms about doing his own debt collecting. But Mick Sayers wasn't so keen on paying his own debts. He would even kill to avoid creditors. Sayers was also a compulsive gambler, which drove him to turn his hand to anything that would keep the money rolling in. Drug dealing, murder for hire and race fixing. Many believed he called the shots in Australia's most notorious race fixing event, the fine cotton ringing. But the gambles Sayers made with his own life didn't pay off. Michael Sayers was a hardened career criminal uh, and he committed all crimes uh, from murder down. He was involved in numerous armed robberies, safe breaks. He was a significant member of the Sydney and Melbourne criminal milieus in the 70s and 80s. Michael Sayers was a, a pretty smart guy in his way. way. He actually came into the Sydney scene from Victoria. He was linked with some notorious Victorians. In fact, he was a one-time um, associate of Chris Flannery. Well, Mick was a flamboyant uh, bloke, you know, professional gambler, what I'd describe as a lout, I guess, you know. He was a likeable rogue. Sayers, uh, in a fairly quick time, 
was got ambitious uh, and again the drug trade. He would have been more involved in the past in standover and all sorts of things, robberies and that. But once he got involved in the drug trade, he saw himself as a future king of crime and uh, he got in the road and they bumped him off. On Saturday night, gunmen ambushed Michael Sayers as he returned to his luxury home at Bronte in Sydney's eastern suburbs. He was shot twice, once in the back as he ran and then from point-blank range in the neck when he fell to the ground. Sayers was a gambler, was unemployed and yet earned property worth more than half a million dollars. He also owned four racehorses and a brand new Mercedes. The word is that uh, Michael Sayers uh, had had a, a decent day in the punt. It was a midweek meeting at Rose Hill Gardens and he'd, he'd had a rare win. Uh, that was all I needed tonight, a change of luck. All I needed. Yeah, onwards and upwards from here. His partner drove up to the garage. It's a little bit of an insight into the character of Michael Sayers, that he was a serious criminal, a gangster, in a Sydney underworld where people were dropping like flies. And Michael Sayers still hadn't got around to organising a remote control garage. Mick, I thought you were going to get new batteries for this. Yeah, all right, hold your fire. Give me the keys. Michael Sayers had to get out and open the garage door. And when he did, a gunman stood on one side of the car with another on the other side of the vehicle in their front yard. Both fired shots at him. <laughs> a third gunman waited for him on the other side of the road at the nature strip with a rifle, came forward and performed the coup de grace. I've got the money! The investigation revealed that Michael Sayers had assets beyond his visible means, which included homes in Melbourne, several, uh, properties in Sydney, motor vehicles, bank accounts, racehorses, the whole deal. He was also a heroin distributor. The information is that he, he stole 400 grand's worth of heroin, obviously because his financial situation was becoming desperate. It was a case of, I, th I would assume, a case of robbing Peter to pay Paul, fending one off with a stick, and then, OK, you're sweet. It made him more reckless, uh, obviously. And in that environment at that time, a reckless crook was, uh, was uh, skating on thin ice. They were coming at Mick from every direction, and he still stood his ground totally stood his ground. He knew they were coming at him from every direction. And as a result of that, he still fronted up every day and, and ultimately that type of attitude finished up getting him killed. Forensic psychologist Anita McGregor sees Sayers' high-risk behaviours, his drug dealing, his drug rip-offs and heavy gambling as possible indicators of a psychopathic personality. One of the characteristics of psychopathy is, is engaging in high-risk behaviours, irresponsibility and recklessness, gambling, drug addiction, those kinds of things fit within that relatively well. Generally, with psychopaths, we see them engaging in behaviours for what they perceive may be short-term gain without thinking about the consequences of, of their behaviour. Gambling's a terrible thing because, you know, it, 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 people refer to it as an addiction. There's no physiological element to it that stands out. You get more and more arousal by chasing your losses, which seems ridiculous. It seems like a contradiction. So he's thinking as he's losing that he's going to get back in control. And of course you don't, you just lose more. It seems Sayers was resigned to his fate he didn't expect the gunman outside his home on the night he died, but he knew his enemies were coming for him. Mick Sayers was born in Melbourne in 1943. He was the eldest of four brothers. The Sayers family grew up within a stone's throw of the famous Caulfield racetrack. His father was an illegal bookmaker who also worked as a bagman for a Caulfield bookie. Sayers was a good sportsman. He played Australian rules football and as a junior, represented his state in field hockey. As the eldest brother, Mick took particular care of his younger siblings. His brother, Robbie, who was five years younger, recalls that he was a devoted elder brother. But even as a young man, Mick Sayers just couldn't stay out of trouble. He was always causing some sort of problem for my father and as he got older. and I can remember one, we both went to Dela cell in Malvern. I remember one year we went to the school Beach night, and I would have been about 10, I suppose. He would have been 15, 16. On the way home, he says, we're not going to walk home, we'll drive home. And I said, we haven't got a car. He said, don't worry about that. He said, I'll break into one and we'll, we'll drive home. And I started crying, and he put his arm around me. He said, oh, don't worry, don't worry about it. He said, we'll walk up. And that's just, he looked after me. He said, he didn't want to take me, because I didn't want to go with him. 
It was a very, uh, I've never forgotten it to this day. And I, I remember he caught me smoking and uh, he made me do the drawback about 20 times. And I would have been, I don't know, 13 or 14. I've never had a smoke since. Next, at the age of 20, Sayers stepped up in the criminal world and robbed a bank. Well, he got charged with robbing a bank, armed robbery. I can remember that. I can remember being at home and the police running down the sideway with a bobcat and digging up the backyard. Obviously looking for something. It would have been money, but they never found anything. And uh, he got uh, 12 or 13 years for that. He did seven of them, I think. Sayers adapted to prison life quickly. And as a gambler, it wasn't long before he was running the betting across the whole prison. Mick was the SP bookie in prison, and uh, and that's and to to know what it means to be the SP bookie in a major prison, and I'm talking Pentridge here. You need to know a little bit about prisoners. You're not allowed to survive as the SP bookie unless you can work in with the screws and you can work in with the heavy crims. Mick survived for years as the SP bookie. Now that lets you know a lot about Mick's ability to communicate and to work with people. The SP bookie also had to be able to, to handle himself because if someone didn't pay a debt, you had to confront them. And if you were the SP bookie and you didn't confront someone over a debt, you, would, you just lost that job. He would have been surrounded by people who had significant background in violence, in aggression, in a whole range of criminal activities. And at that age, he would unfortunately have seen himself move from being a manageable situation to being a situation where there was always the potential threat of extreme violence in the system. Mick on many occasions fronted up. In fact, he had one of the great all-time fights with a very hardened prisoner, Stephen Sellers, who, who was one of the best fighters, street fighters in the game, and he handled himself pretty well. It was a ferocious fight where they both they both came out even. This is in Mick's early days. So Mick was no uh, shrinking violet. Towards the end of Sayers' sentence, Sayers was joined by soon-to-be notorious hitman Christopher Rantakil Flannery. Flannery had been sentenced to nine years in prison for rape and a string of other offences. Sayers and Flannery hit it off. The two men became close friends and plotted their lives after prison. They want 250 grand out of it. Like the Kane brothers are a handful. And if they want a sling, you have to pay them. It's as simple as that. I haven't got two bob to rub together. Can't get blood from a stone. But they'll get blood out of you, mate. Anyway, where's the cash from the arm rope? Blew it all on my legal bills. Mate, they fired a fucking shotgun through my kid's bedroom window. Well, mate, you know what you need? New scenery. Oh, bugger, Sydney, Chris. Freeman and the big fella have got it all sewed up. Nah, nah, mate, they don't mind a couple of young blokes with a bit of going and going up and doing a bit of business. Mate, and Sydney's got the best cops money can buy. Freeman and McPherson, mate. They won't be around forever. My missus will never leave Melbourne. <laughs> So what's the bad news? Mate, my kids. Mate, if you hang around here, they won't have a dad anyway. Come to Sydney, mate. Hey, I know some good cops up there. I'm sure they'll hit you up for a big drink now and then, but they're nothing like the dogs around here. Well, I've got to do something. You're stuffed if you stay here, son. For all his experience as a criminal, he was routinely led around by the nose by other crooks. And Chris Flannery was a perfect example. But Flannery got into his ear and basically told him, or insinuated, that the Sydney organised crime scene, the McPhersons, the Freemans, they could be rolled. That they were older men and a, a challenge from young, fit blokes like Michael Sayers and Chris Flannery could bring them undone. They were both the same sort of calibre. They were, they were rural outs. Always wanted to flee and boy, and always wanted to show their guns. And they were always a little bit outlandish, you know, a little bit, you know, they wanted to stand out amongst everyone. But I guess, you know, coming from another state, uh, they were trying to make a little bit of a name for themselves here. So I guess they thought that was probably the way to do it. 
Now, mate, you know what you need? New scenery. Oh, bugger, Sydney, Chris. Freeman and the big fella have got it all sewed up. Nah, nah, mate, they don't mind a couple of young blokes with a bit of going and going up and doing a bit of business. Essentially, Flannery convinced him that those two men and a few of their mates could go up from Melbourne and take over this established criminal network that not even the Mafia could crack ten years before. You can see where this is going to end up. You've got to understand the difference between Melbourne and Sydney. Sydney's a place where you work with the police. Melbourne's a place where if you do work with the police, you th no one wants to know you. But the thing about Melbourne crims going up to Sydney and take, trying to take over the town, that's what used to happen with Sydney crims coming down to, to Melbourne and trying to take over the town. That has always been the case. That'll never change. Mate, and Sydney's got the best cops money can buy. Freeman and McPherson, mate. They won't be around forever. Again, that comes down to that concept of entitlement that they think they can do this stuff, you know? They don't think through the consequences. They think that they are bigger, meaner and tougher, maybe because they believe the Melbourne-Sydney rivalry, I don't know. But they've got some sense of themselves as being in control. And it's false. It's an illusion of control. But nonetheless, they, they have this sense. And, of course, they don't have, because it's just far too big a patch for them to be able to control. I've got to do something. You're stuffed if you stay here, son. Whether it was the influence of Flannery or the horrendous conditions in each division, the easygoing Sayers came out of jail a changed man. I think he was more ruthless. He didn't care after he'd been in there. He was more so, I could tell, after H Division. Before then, he, he could cope with most things. I'm not saying he didn't cope, but he, he was a different, far different person. It's hard to pinpoint why. But he was, it was very, he was very hard and ruthless after that. When Sayers emerged from prison in 1973, he believed he was a marked man and Melbourne offered him no future. The former bookmaker of Pentridge Prison decided to take the biggest gamble of his life. He turned his back on his wife and headed for Sydney. Sayers always maintained that, that, that he did this out of a sense of valour, out of a sense of honour, that he left his wife and children because life had become too dangerous for him in Melbourne. And with him not in Melbourne, his family, his wife and his children would be left alone. He believed that he'd done essentially the right thing. It's hard to know what his motivations were for actually leaving his family. If you, you know, it's possible that he did leave his family because he is trying to protect them. Another possibility is they might also get in the way of doing what he wants to do. And so it's just easier for him to actually just leave them. And the question is, is was he attached to his family? Was there that emotional kind of connection to his family? Was that a difficult thing for him to do? If he was connected to them, his decision to leave was obviously more important or more opportunistic than his decision to stay with him. His first foray into crime in Sydney was a disaster. He was convicted of burglary after attempting to break into a hotel safe. For that, Sayers found himself back in prison for another four years. After his release, Sayers decided to step into the illegal gambling industry. He operated as an SP bookmaker. He ran illegal casinos in Sydney and spread his wings to the Gold Coast, establishing yet another casino there. He also gained a reputation as one of the biggest punters in Sydney. He told me he was at a, a, a legal casino in Sydney and he was playing with $10,000 chips and he was playing next to a bookmaker. And the bookmaker said, why don't you have a decent bet? Unbeknownst to the bookmaker, the chips, they didn't have $100,000 chips. And he'd made an arrangement that the 10000 were really 100000 And he couldn't tell him. He just kept playing and, you know, mind his own business. But he was a $100,000 a chip gambler. And he, everyone would want to bet with him, but he, he, it was pretty big, it was pretty big. And, and you're talking 25 years ago, a lot of money. Yeah, I can remember meeting him at the uh, Royal Oak Hotel with Nettie Smith, and that was the main settling place in the old days for a lot of the SP uh, bookmakers around the area. And I can always remember this night because he had a briefcase with him and uh, he couldn't help himself and he just had to undo the briefcase uh, on the bar, lift it up and on, it was probably 200,000 in, I suppose. And uh, sitting on top of it was a big 45 automatic. 
I remember having a bit of a crack at him a bit. I said, well, what, what do you want to show us that for, mate? What was the whole idea of that exercise? He said, well, I didn't show you that. He said, I'm just showing you how much I won today. I said, all right, well, that's really good, mate. Have a good day. Another Melbourne criminal had taken the trip to establish himself in Sydney, Les Cole. He was a standover man and former painter and docker who gambled heavily. Back in 1981, Les Cole owed money to nearly everyone, but his largest debt lay with Mick Sayers. Sayers knew from his time as a bookie in Pentridge that debts can never be overlooked, but a bashing in the prison showers is a lot easier than murder. Says probably been reading the day of the jackal. He thought he could get Les Cole in the, in the crosshairs and, and do away with him that way. Of course, the normal way that a gangster dispatches another gangster is up close and personal, and and Michael Says would have to learn that because Les Cole survived his injuries. Well, I think the further away you are, the easier it is to kill. So I think that maybe there's an element of making a easier for him to do that psychologically because it is a big step to take someone else's life but it also as happened increases the risk of it not working and so he just ends up by complicating what would otherwise have been perhaps a more simple um, arrangement in the way that michael sayers thought he thought it was best that he go back now that les cole had survived he go back and finish les cole off it was some months later, Les Cole was, had recuperated in hospital and returned home. He was receiving daily physiotherapy and uh, at that stage, of course, after the shooting, Les Cole had had a number of security devices installed into his home. Not gonna miss this time, Liz. Oh, you're fucking kidding, Mick. Do I look like I'm kidding? This time he's compelled to make sure he's close enough that he's able to get the job done that he's been asked to do because I imagine his colleagues, his, his peers, would have not tolerated repeated failures. So he had to do the job, had to do it properly, had to make sure it was done properly. Michael Sayers had broken into the garage and lay in wait there. Cole struggled out of the car, still getting over his injuries from being shot, and uh, Michael Sayers came forward and shot him at point-blank range, and uh, he fled from the scene. Do I look like I'm kidding? Forensic psychologist Stephen Barron sees a significant change in Sayer's psyche from the first attempt to take Cole's life to the second. 
So a personal act of violence is something done very, very close. An act of violence was done at some distance is less personal. It's still personal, but it's less personal because I'm not going to be within range that you get to see me and acknowledge me at the time I'm going to be killing you. So Michael Sayers didn't have the background of personalised violence. And I would imagine that using a firearm from some distance would have been preferable to him than walking up to someone with a Glock or a Sega and shooting someone within a three metre range. You're fucking kidding, Mick. Mick Sayers was not one for living in the shadows. He preferred a life of fast cars, fast women, and the thrill of the pump. He did not completely forget his family, though. Every Christmas, his children and his brothers and their families would visit Sayers at his luxury home in Bronte. During these visits, he always seemed happy to see his children. To his family, he looked like a success story, but in truth, Sayers was up to his teeth in debt. Like any compulsive gambler, he was always able to ignore his losses because the next big win always seemed to be just around the corner. He loved gambling. He loved playing cards up the cross. I've never, I never ever went there with him, so it never interested me. But uh, he used to go to the cross and play cards. He loved gambling. That was his whole life, gambling. I suppose you could say that was his whole life, a big gamble. Mick was always a desperate punter, so one minute he was up, next minute he was down, and, you know, and he bet in huge amounts, mate. And he got himself in a lot of trouble because of it. Michael dressed flash, he drove a nice flashy car, he was flashy in his demeanour, and his flamboyance would have suited him being at the racetrack. I guess his main downfall was his, his gambling and his rip-offs of uh, friends and acquaintances that he, he did business with, and unfortunately that probably ended his demise. Even your, you know, your average um, um, person who has an addiction problem, even without any criminal behaviours, would be more likely to turn to crime out of desperation in terms of trying to pay off their gambling debts or get more money. And I guess for a lot of people that actually snowballs, they also tend to have problems with impulsivity to begin with. With criminal behavior, all of that's just heightened. The fine cotton ring-in was one of the lowest points in Australian horse racing history. Mick Sayers is said to have been the organizer of those involved in the affair from racing circles in Queensland. They were all thrown together to substitute a picnic horse, fine cotton, with the better performed Dashing Solitaire. It was a disaster. An injury prevented Dashing Solitaire from running. And with just days to go before the race, they had to swap in another horse, Bold Personality. The problem was Bold Personality looked nothing like fine cotton. Back in Sydney, Sayers knew nothing of this. He believed the ring-in would go off without a hitch. He could clear his ledger with all his debtors, including Sydney crime heavyweight, George Freeman. This will need to be extremely good, Mick. It's good, mate. Gold. A no-risk earn. Mick, plenty of people have said that sort of thing to me and that. What do you got? This is good, George. I only came to you because you've been very patient. I know that, and you deserve to be well looked after here. And what do you got, Mick? The kind of gamble you love, George. A gamble that's not a gamble. Where and when? Eagle Farm, next Wednesday, race six, nag eight. Fine cotton. What's the score? It ain't fine cotton. Go on. I've organised a bit of a switch. Dashing solitaire is the dead spit of fine cotton, but ten lengths quicker. Guaranteed. Ironclad, mate. You'll start at 25 to 1. But keep it under your hat. Help yourself to as much as you want, but we don't want him paying even odds at the jump. You're into me for a large quid, Mick. It'll all be sorted by next Wednesday, mate. I can't have it going on. I can't cut you the slack I'd like to, or everyone will be having a crack in that. Next Wednesday, mate. Dead set. All right. I'll have a lash. <laughs> Thanks, Mick. Sweet, George. See you later, mate. Franco, yeah, got a little job for your son. Yeah. Take a few of the lads up to Brisbane next Wednesday. Have a day out the races on me. 
Pay special attention to race number six. Horse there called Fine Cotton. Yeah, I don't think it is Fine Cotton. Make sure you let the stewards know all about it and that. Fine Cotton still in front past the 200. Harbour Gold inch by inch is going to pick him up now. Harbour Gold get up to Fine Cotton with 100 to go and they'll fight it out. Fine Cotton won't give in. Harbour Gold, Fine Cotton, Fine Cotton's going to hold on, I think. Oh, he's just in front. Oh, he may have won by a nose. There's nothing in it. Yes! 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 2.25pm on August 18 at Brisbane's Eagle Farm. A heavily backed unknown bush scrubber called Fine Cotton beats a field which could have escaped from a glue factory and sparks off one of the most extraordinary scandals in Australian racing history. We now know, of course, that the winning horse wasn't Fine Cotton at all and didn't even look like Fine Cotton. It was another obscure beast called Bold Personality, allegedly substituted by a small-time Adelaide trainer, Hayden Hightana. It was a disaster from go to woe. It was never going to fly. And Sayers had invested thousands of dollars and he'd made the mistake of telling George Freeman that he'd organised this ring in and George, jump on it, you'll make a fortune. What do you got, Mick? The kind of gamble you love, George. Gamble that's not a gamble. Where and when? Well, George knew it was going to be a disaster and he sent half a dozen blokes up to Brisbane Go and stand at the rails, legal farm, on the day. And when Bold Personality stuck its nose in front to win the race as fine cotton, they started screaming and yelling, ring in, ring in, stewards, wake up yourselves. Well, the stewards did, did rouse from their slumber, and the first thing they noticed was the fine cotton didn't look anything like fine cotton. And they disqualified fine cotton. The horse that ran second, Harvest Gold, would have been the favourite. I was paying five to one, and guess who backed it? George Freeman, and he won a monster. And Mick Sayers, he did the lot. The sting with fine cotton sounded simple. Ring in a good horse for the bush ruffy, and then back the good horse to win a fortune. But Hayden Hightana now says there may have been a double sting. Some bookies and punters knew a ring in was on, and by making sure that it was discovered, they were the ones who collected the fortune. He, he blabbed, and unfortunately, that was the problem with the whole thing. Everyone, no one could keep it a secret. The, the best, all the great plungers are orchestrated with complete secrecy. Uh, but Fine Cotton was different. Sayers told too many people. He had it going for maybe one and a half million. I think he owed three million through SPing on rigged races, and he was and he didn't realise it. So he was trying to get something bad. He had it going for about 1.5 million, which might have wiped his slate too. That might have been about enough for him to get out of the hole. But yeah, the mail is that uh, Sayers uh, was stood to gain the most. But Freeman, being a wily operator, uh, he decided that there was an opportunity for him to cash in on uh, what would turn out to be Mick Sayers' misery. Forensic psychologist Chris Lennings believes the disaster of the fine cotton affair was just another example of Sayer's compulsive behaviour. Well, it's that convincing yourself of the unreal. I mean, what occurs in some of these characters is they just convince themselves that this is going to work. And it's, it's like they, you, you, you plan a campaign, you try and do your chess work, you try and work out what happens if, where's your consequences, what happens down the road here. But if you're not very good at doing that because you're, you're disposed to being impulsive in your decision making, or you're not very good at that because you've knocked off a few brain cells along the way, then you make some pretty bad errors. And that seems to be what happened in the Alfine Cotton. Just didn't think it through. To say as the fine cotton ring-in was a complete disaster. Instead of squaring up with his creditors, he ended up hundreds of thousands of dollars further in debt. Ever the gambler, Sayers had to roll the dice again. He needed money fast, and the fastest way to make it was with drugs. His old mate, Chris Flannery, had plenty of contacts in the drug business, and Sayers carefully nurtured them. For a while, the drug money did keep pace with his gambling losses. Well, that period in our history, 1984, 1985, the mid-1980s, it was quite an amazing time. There was tremendous activity in organised crime. And pretty much it came down at the end of the day to competition between different criminal gangs for control of the illicit drug market. And they would not stop short of 
murder. Things changed into the 80s because more and more criminals, and even some old style criminals, that is, who were just used to robbing banks, got more and more involved in the drug trade, and it changed the whole nature of the scene in Sydney. And people like Lenny McPherson were very concerned about it. More so later, when some of these people really thought they were going to take over. You could make more money out of illicit drugs in one week than people could over a 12-month period on many armed hold-ups. Mick Sayers was trapped by his lifestyle and his addictions. In August of 1984, police searched his Bronte home and found two handguns and a trafficable amount of cocaine, heroin and marijuana. The police search was made easy. Mick Sayers hadn't even bothered to hide the guns and drugs. Sayers was bailed and immediately returned to his criminal lifestyle. If you're starting to lose territory, if you're starting to lose um, your, your, your mojo, for want of a better word, what's occurring is that you become more desperate. You take gambles, you, you cut corners, you try to hope, you, you instill some sense in yourself that, oh, look, it'll work anyway. And that's what it sounds like with him, that what was occurring is that he starts off with a good idea, it doesn't work out, he tries to fix it by a quick fix, that doesn't work out, and so bit by bit, he just becomes more and more desperate in his decision-making as he finds that he's put himself in a position where he just can't get out of. Sayers was racking up huge losses as a gambler. He owed money all around town. His creditors were some of Sydney's biggest drug traffickers, including the biggest of them all, Danny the Brain Chubb. Sayers and Flannery decided there was one easy way of dealing with him. You just bring him down, remember? I'll finish him off. I know, I know. Just wing the prick. You walk back to the car, you don't run. Get it started and wait for me. I know, mate, I know. He won't have time to shit himself. Oh, fuck, it's better than sex. Thanks for bringing me in on this, mate. You'll solve a lot of problems. There is, get down, get down, get down. pistol and a shotgun outside his mother's home at Miller's Point in inner Sydney last November. Chubb had many criminal convictions in New South Wales and Victoria. Chubb was unemployed, yet owned a late model Jaguar, plus a villa valued at a quarter of a million dollars near Nara on the south coast. In 1984, a Sydney criminal by the name of Danny Chubb was shot outside his mother's home in Miller's Point. He was a major heroin importer, and it was alleged that uh, he had a network of heroin distributors, uh, which involved quite a few very well-known Sydney criminals, including the late uh, Michael Sayers. Part of an investigation into Danny's Chubb, Danny Chubb's death, I should say, revealed that uh, Chubb had extended $500,000 worth of credit to Michael Sayers. People owed him 700,000, you know, 1.5 million. I mean, there was money under his bed that day, I believe, that disappeared, you know. And uh, I've been down there a hundred times and passed him 40, 50,000, 100,000. He just pulled it out, put it in a big calico bag underneath his bed. There was millions there, you know. But he started to want to rule the roost with the money that he had. And, of course, that got uh, the egos of the rest of organised crime out of... got their nose out of joint and... Uh, so they decided they couldn't care if he was bringing in what he was bringing in, he had to go. No charges have ever been laid in relation to the murder of Danny Chubb. While many believe Sayers and Flannery were responsible for Chubb's death, Graham Henry and his then partner in crime, Nettie Smith, were considered strong suspects. But Henry and Smith had airtight alibis. I'm not going to uh, enlighten anyone on who did it. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been blamed and uh, I was the last one with him, along with uh, Nettie Smith. We had a conversation with him up in the hotel that day and got a couple of kilos of heroin off him. 
you know, it was probably 10, 15 minutes later, we got a phone call at uh, the Star Hotel at Redfern, and he'd been um, shot dead. After the death of Chubb, Sayers was in good spirits. He, all of a sudden, he didn't owe this large amount of money that he did owe to Chubb. And basically, he proceeded along his merry way in SP bookmaking and punting like a madman, while Chris Flannery went his own way. Hitting him in the back isn't weaning him out. Drive, you prick! The murder of Sydney's biggest heroin trafficker, Danny Chubb, lit the fuse on Sydney's gang wars. The battle for control of Sydney's drug trade had begun. By the end of 1984, Sayers owed up to two and a half million dollars. His new source for heroin was emerging drug dealer Barry McCann, a man with a long history of violence. Sayers was heavily indebted to McCann, and he knew McCann would have him killed in a second if he didn't pay up. When his family gathered at his home in Bronte for yet another Christmas, Robbie Sayers noticed his brother was distracted. Mick normally acted carefree, but on this occasion, he was edgy. Well, I could see that he wasn't, he was very uh, apprehensive, he was jumpy, he wasn't the same. You know, normally he's the, he's the life of the party, he organised everything, what are we going to do? We'd go out for lunch, we'd have barbecues. And I said to him, I said, listen, I said, there's something wrong. He said, oh, yes. And just, this is after the fact, you know, I thought about it later, you know, months later, he said, yeah, he said, uh, I'm off. I said, what do you mean you're off? He said, you know, I'm off. I said, well, why don't you go away? Get on a plane and go. He, he, he said, listen, when you're off, you're off. When a criminal says he's off, it means he's marked for execution. So why didn't Mick Sayers get on a plane and disappear? I mean, there are two possible explanations. One of them is to give up. He understands that he's just not going to get out of this one. And so, you know, it's business as usual because, you know, it happens, it happens, manana kind of stuff. That's one explanation. The second one is he fails to understand the consequences of what he's done. That somehow or other he's hoping for a miracle, that he thinks that, you know, he's invulnerable. He's had so much bad luck in what's been going on, because mainly through his own bad management, that he's probably got to the point where he thinks, I'll oh, stuff it. Mick Sayers got the feeling he had outstayed his welcome in the Sydney crime scene. The networks led by George Freeman and Lenny McPherson, combined with a new group led by Barry McCann, packed too much punch. Sayers owed money all over town, and there were rumours he was a marked man. But ever the gambler, he had one more card to play. in the car, mate. Didn't know if you'd front. I really appreciate this at short notice. Six keys. You want all of it? Shit, yeah, mate. I can get rid of this easy. And anything else you can get me? Oh, yeah. I've got a good stream. There's a lot of gear. Don't go flogging it through any of Billy's networks or he'll be whinging and moaning me all day. No, Barry. I'm eastern suburbs, mate. Rooster country. No, we need Billy. Good boy. So what's the gear like, mate? Is it any good? Top drawer. You can jump on it four or five times. Make it decent good for yourself. Speaking of which... Sorry, mate. Miles away. No offence, but I wish you were. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All we got to do now is the business side of things. Right, yeah, the casserola. It was in the car, it's just over there, around the corner. I'll go get it. You can leave that if you want. Mate, I'm right there, around the corner. I'll drive by and put the money right in your hand. I'll be waiting. by some Asians. Fucking kung fu blokes. They took the money and the heroin. I thought they were gonna fucking kill me. You got a week. Why 
Well, once Fine Cop went wrong, Mick Sayers got very, very desperate. And he needed money, and he needed it quickly. He didn't mind that he didn't have to pay the SP bookies, but he lived a high lifestyle, and he needed money. So he got hold of Barry McCann. And McCann was the biggest heroin dealer in Sydney at the time. And Sayers and McCann would, would meet in the car park of a Glebe hotel. McCann had a briefcase full of heroin. Handed it over to Mick Sayers. Said, there you go. Thanks, Barry. I'll just go and get the money. Came back about five, maybe ten minutes later. All exasperated and frustrated. You wouldn't believe what's happened to me, Barry. You wouldn't believe what's happened to me. I just got rolled by some Asians. Fucking kung fu blokes. They took the money and the heroin. But Barry McCann had been around a bit too long to put up with that sort of nonsense. And he looked Mick Sayers in the eye and said, I want my money or I want my heroin or you're dead. You've got a week. February the 16th, Michael John Sayers, known to be involved in the heroin scene and a popular figure in the Sydney underworld, was gunned down in the street only metres from his lavish Waverley home. He was shot in the back as he fled down the street and then at point-blank range in the head. At the time of his death, Sayers was awaiting committal on charges of supply and possession of heroin and cocaine. On an average, most at that time, most of them would have lived with the, with the, with the idea in their head that uh, this, this day might be their last day. Often there was a level of arrogance. They wouldn't think it could happen to them. Uh, often they thought they were much more important than what they were. I mean, that's just the way it is. You put, you know, put 10 grand into someone's pocket and all of a sudden they think it means that they're bulletproof. It's hard not to form the view that it's a, a guy who hasn't really put a lot of time and energy into thinking about things and that he's just acting on, on instinct and doesn't understand really the consequences of his behaviour at all. That kind of fits the profile in some ways. A lot of these folks don't. They do things because they do act on instinct. They, they act rapidly, they, they do stupid things because it's the idea that comes into their mind and they don't filter it through. It's hard to work out exactly what he might have been thinking, but the only thing you can think of is that he just didn't really think. Mick Sayers was a gambler. He owed money all over town. Um, he tried to fix it with heroin dealing, and he may have caused a big rift with Barry McCann. It's often said that uh, Mick Sayers pinched heroin from Barry McCann. Um, and blamed Chris Flannery for it. There was bad blood between McCann and Sayers. Barry McCann and his associates were involved in a rather large drug network. Mick Sayers obviously got involved, and I think as a result, he owed the network a lot of money, couldn't pay, and I think that that may well have brought about his demise. I, th I really think he got in over his head. You know, he was always ripping off someone, so there was always a hundred suspects, so... But as it is in organised crime, mate, when players go down or involved in organised crime, you usually don't see anyone arrested unless someone else is used as the bunny. So that's the way it works in this big town. The career of Mick Sayers is one where a Melbourne crook moves to Sydney, does well for a short time, and dies by violence. No one has ever been convicted of the murder of Michael Sayers. This has left his family in a state of emotional limbo. No one has been brought to justice for the man they loved. Well, it had a great effect on his children, um, on his father, his brothers, my wife. Um, Well, it, it is, but in my mind, it's not. You know, I, I, I know what happened, and I was told very early in the piece what had happened by certain people. And there was, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. You can't do much about it, really. Mick Sayers, the man driven by a compulsion to build a criminal empire, was murdered. It's a murder that remains unsolved. 
Mick Sayers the gambler had lived his entire life on the edge, one step ahead of the law and dodging his creditors. Eventually, he squared the ledger with his life.